Hi guys, today I'm going to talk about a camera that I think is actually quite underrated. It caused a little bit of controversy when it first came out, but now you see big time creators like Peter Lindgren, Terry Warfield, Jason Morris, and most importantly, me using this camera as one of their main, if not their main content creation camera. This camera does all of what I am looking for and more, and it is uh, right here, the ZV. E1. Don't turn this off. This is a really good camera. Let me explain. So towards the end of the video, I will talk about the drawbacks of this camera because there are a few. Nothing in life is perfect, unless you're talking about my hair right now. Straight out of the shower, no product or anything. Pretty good. But I will give you seven points as to why this camera is so valuable to me. And if I broke it tomorrow, which who knows, maybe I will, I would run out and buy another one immediately. Here we go. Number one, that beautiful FX6 sensor. Of course, first and foremost, we have to mention this little camera has the same sensor as the FX6, the FX3, and the A7S3. That is image quality that everybody is striving, well, maybe not everybody, but many, many people strive to get that wonderful A7S3, FX3, FX6 look right here in this little camera, a 12 megapixel sensor. And right now I'm shooting on the A7IV and I love this camera, I absolutely love it. And this camera is sharper than this camera, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean better image quality. There is something about the image quality that comes off of this sensor. It just looks so great, so organic, so filmic. Can I say filmic? Filmic. Number two, I will talk about the higher frame rates. You get 4K 60, 10 bit, 422 at no crop, and you get 4K 120, 10 bit. 422 at a small 1.1 times crop. And uh, the 4K 120, 4K 120 is not created equal on all cameras. On this camera, because it's so great in low light and those high frame rates, they require higher shutter speeds and more light. So a lot of times when you have a 4K 120, you get a very noisy image, but not on this bad boy. So much of my product showcasing, like anything that I'm trying to film in that nice 4K 120, I'm always picking up this camera because the 4K 120 looks so dang good. Rolling shutter, it is hard to find a camera with better rolling shutter than this guy right here, unless maybe you get that new A9 III with the global shutter, but this rolling shutter is so fantastic. You won't see any of the jellos. You can do the whips and the pans. You can film the NASCAR, the Tour de France, Lance Armstrong going past, trying to sneak back in to the circuit because he was banned as far as I know, but I'm not a big cycle racing. Let's just move on. This thing will be able to capture Lance and whoever else is flying by. No slanty lines, no anything. Great rolling shutter on the ZV-E1. Number four, surprisingly great photos. Most people aren't thinking about this camera as a photo camera because it doesn't have an EVF and it has 12 megapixels. But uh, what happened with me is I often am just taking this out. I think I'm gonna do some video work and then I notice, oh boy, I need to take some photos. Too bad I only had the ZV-E1 with me. And then I saw the photo quality that came off it. And from that point on, no hesitation to take photos with this guy. They look so great, unless you're printing really large or you're really cropping in on your photos. 12 megapixels can be just fine, especially for online content, thumbnails, things like that. The uh, 12 megapixel sensor will be absolutely fine for you. And uh, I am really impressed with the photos that come off of this camera. Number five is the size and weight. This camera is so small, you can pack it up, put it in your camera bag with a bunch of lenses, small, light, easy to carry around. Like, look at this here. Let me get my overhead rig. This right here is my FX30, which is the same size as the Sony FX3. And you see how much bigger it is. Let me just flip it up like this. Look at this. The difference in size is quite dramatic with these two cameras, even if, I take the APS-C Sony A6700. You see right there, they are pretty much the same size. And the A6700 is a nice compact camera. And I love this a lot as well. But uh, having a full frame camera like this do at the same size as the A6700, that is just, it's so convenient for gimbal work, which a lot of people like to use this guy on. So no EVF, which is better for the gimbal because it's nice flat there and you have uh, more clearance on the top. And then it's so little light. Mm, love the size and weight of the ZV-E1. Now here come the two that make this camera indispensable to me. Number six is the dynamic 
active stabilization. The dynamic active stabilization on this thing is bananas. I like the active stabilization of the latest Sony cameras, but this dynamic active stabilization, it cranks it up a notch. And yes, it does crop in, but you can get lenses like a 20 millimeter or the Viltrox 16 millimeter. If you get a 20 millimeter, then, uh, you know, get one yourself a little selfie stick if you're doing the vlogging, that is, and extend it out a little bit, and that'll be fine for a 20 millimeter, even on uh, the active, the dynamic active stabilization. And of course, the, you can get the 16 to 35 G Master 2.8, or you can get the 16 to 35 F4, which is a smaller and lighter lens, and uh, then you don't even need the extension on the selfie stick. And then using that dynamic active stabilization with a 16 millimeter lens, it is just, it looks so good and it's so stable. It's gimbal-like footage without a gimbal. So you talk about small and light, easy to carry around. I also don't have to take a gimbal when I use this. I am always using that dynamic active stabilization. And the last major point that I will mention is the dual gain sensor at 640 in S-Log3 and 12,800. So you could call this low light if you want, but I am going to be specific about that dual sensor, that dual native ISO of uh, 640 and 12,800. The reason being is often I am somewhere where I'll just flip it to 12,000 800 so I know I have a really clean image and then I can adjust my aperture so like when I was out at uh, a convention here at Profusion it's called it's here in Toronto and it's a pretty big camera convention especially for Canada and uh, I wanted to get a lot in focus I didn't want a shallow depth of field I wanted to shoot at you know like f8 f9 I wanted to show more of the uh, booths that were in focus I didn't want just a razor thin shallow depth of field but to shoot f9 in a room that wasn't lit up that well then uh, I just switched it over to 12,800 and I just it looked fantastic I absolutely I'm surprised at the amount of times I use it you go into a museum you go into any building really that uh, doesn't have professional studio lights then you can just flip it in 12,800 and then change your f-stop to whatever you see fit and it's just you're still going to get that super clean image like you're shooting at uh, the base ISO of 640 just absolutely love that ability and none of my other cameras can do that, which is another reason I always take this when I want to shoot some video. Now, I can mention a bunch of other good points about this camera. It has that cool little cine vlog mode. It has a product showcase mode, vertical video. You can just turn the camera and then it will stay in vertical video mode. You don't have to rotate that in post. Lots of little great features on this camera, but uh, the seven I mentioned, those are the primary drivers as to why I use this camera so much. Now, of course, there are drawbacks, as I mentioned at the beginning. You can't have it all. Like you just, there are compromises. When you have a camera this small and light and this powerful, of course, you're going to get some overheating issues. Now, in many situations, the overheating issue is overblown for a lot of people. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people who simply should not use this camera. If you are filming three hour weddings, you're out in the sunshine, you know, in, in uh, like the Texas heat this this camera is going to probably overheat on you but uh, for my use case the only time this camera overheats for me is if I'm doing an overheating test or if I am live streaming for more than uh, 30 minutes uh, or if maybe I run the camera on 4k 120 for a long period of time my regular shooting here at like 22 degrees in my studio it just simply doesn't overheat at all so one thing I do is if I'm going to use it for a long session or I want to do a lot of 4k or if I do want to stream with this camera which is another point you know what I could have mentioned that in my seven points it should have been an eighth point I love the USB-C streaming coming straight out of here right from the camera into your computer you don't have to uh, do anything you can do 4k 30 streaming without a capture card and the quality looks fantastic but like I said after 25 30 minutes it is going to overheat on you so I got this little fan from Ulanzi and it's got these little suction cups on the back can you see that there overhead rig little suction cups on the back and uh, you can just stick it 
to the ZVE one. That is the little film that comes with it that you stick on it right there. But the truth is you don't even need to apply that film because what you really should do is take a little elastic band and attach that to the back because the suction cups tend to fall off anyway. It works absolutely fantastically. I just wish the suction cups would be stronger. But um, so what I do is I use a little black elastic band, but that's only for when I want it for streaming or if I'm going to do like 4K 120 for a long period of time. I almost never use this fan in my day to day use of the camera shooting 45 50 minutes here in the studio. No problem at all. If I'm out and about in the world, turning the camera on and off, no overheating issues whatsoever for me. Of course, your mileage may vary, but I will say if you can try it out and use it in your workflow, it would be worth it to try it out. And if it does overheat on you, okay, so be it. But uh, for a lot of people, they're finding that for what they do, they're not getting any overheating that they need to be concerned about. Certainly for me, it's, I don't even think about it anymore. Unless I am live streaming, then uh, the fan just stays in the camera bag. Of course, if the build quality, it is a plastic build for the most part, and it doesn't feel exactly premium, but it's still a solid little camera, and I have no problem with it at all. My ZV-E10 is also a plastic type camera, and I have dropped that on boats in Newfoundland, looking at whales banging around the ship. It is still going fine. These cameras, for me, they are tough enough, and uh, but I wouldn't take it out in a monsoon or use it, you know, to bludgeon people. I just to take care of your camera and it should be just fine. And the last point, it has no EVF, which can be good in the sense that it makes it smaller and lighter and better for gimbals. But, uh, you know, in bright sunshine, taking photos, it's always nice to have an EVF. Or if you're even shooting video, nice to have an EVF at times. So I totally get it. For pros who want a full-size HDMI, they want two card slots for redundant recording. They want a workhorse of a camera that simply won't overheat. This camera is definitely not for those people. But for those of us who are doing a lot of content creation, I just can't think of a better camera for the price for what it can do. It is just something I absolutely love using and I am finding a lot of content creators are coming around on the ZV-E1 and putting it in their camera bag. And let me know down below if you like the camera, if you don't, what camera do you like? What would be your most used camera right now at the moment? We'll have a nice little discussion about it. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for watching this. Okay, bye-bye.